Good afternoon. My name is Christiana Segura Hall, and I'm the office manager for the New York and DC office with Walter P. Moore. Well, and welcome to our passion behind design, the projects that make us. Walter P. Moore is a global engineering firm with over 26 offices around the world specializing in sports, aviation, healthcare, office buildings, and higher education projects. Today, we have David Ford presenting Preserving Aviation Landmarks, The Art of Being a Building Doctor. Here's David. Thank you, Christiana. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, I'm David Ford. I'm a senior principal with Walter P. Moore and a managing director here in Kansas City, Missouri. So I'm um, coming from the Midwest. It's a nice afternoon here. So I wanted to give a little background about myself. I am been doing uh, what we call forensic engineering for over 20 years. And, uh, you know, this is a picture of me and, and some of our team just from a few weeks ago doing an investigation of a of a roof system. But uh, we get to uh, touch and feel buildings every day and not just uh, do analysis in the office. So it's, it's pretty rewarding to, to put your hands on the actual buildings that we're designing. So a little more about myself. I am from, uh, I was born in Chicago. So like I said, uh, I'm a Midwest kid. I also grew up here in Kansas City, so um, I've been in both cities uh, about half of my life, but uh, I wanted to get away for college, so I went to uh, North Carolina A&T State University, which is a historically black college located in Greensboro, North Carolina. So I went there for architectural engineering, and, and that really cemented my, my love for buildings going through the program there and um, learning all about how we put buildings together. And from there, I went to the University of Illinois because I was uh, trying to get closer the home and I did my master's degree focused on structural engineering. So like I said, from there, I, I went straight into the field of what we call building forensics. I've been doing this over 20 years, been with Walter P. Moore 16 years. And um, I'm a licensed engineer in several states. I'm also what we call a registered roof consultant. So I, I understand how we you know, design roofing systems. I'm a registered waterproofing consultant. So I understand how to keep buildings watertight. And I'm also a lead accredited because I'm really interested in sustainability and how that relates to existing buildings. So uh, I, I think you kind of follow my background and in, in my education, really, I, I tried to put myself in a place where I could work on uh, old buildings a lot and do investigations and preservation of, of existing buildings. So I really do love investigating and preserving what we, we, we call landmarks. I've gotten to work on several buildings that are on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, there's also buildings we've worked on that are national historic landmarks. And so that's been really rewarding throughout uh, my career. Um, but uh, Christiana, are there any questions thus far on my background? Anything that you um, want to ask? Someone asked, um, what is forensic engineering and why forensics? Forensics engineering is it's a skill that you learn um, mostly on in practice as a, in your career, but you're, you're, you're investigating why a building's performing a certain way or investigating why a building may have a leak or a structural failure. And um, it's a step-by-step -step process where you gather all the information on the design of the building. And then you talk to the people that use the building and then you also go to the building and do your own survey and testing and you bring all that information together and it allows you to make some opinions about the future of the building, how to preserve it, how to make it better. So I'd say that's what forensic engineering is. And and why why do I do it? Because I love old buildings and it's just really easy for me to um work with people who own these buildings who may be um, stressed about 
how they're not performing and then help them fix it. And that I find that real rewarding too. That's awesome. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have any more questions, um, but I'll remember to keep your questions in the chat. All right. So I will talk about um, really this place in, in Kansas City is at our uh, Kansas City International Airport, but um, we call it the KCI Overhaul Base. And here's an image of one of the buildings. This is actually what we call the super hangar. So I'll get into more of the details here. So at the Kansas City Overhaul Base, there are these two buildings which are connected to each other, but they were built um, several years ago. The uh, building to the right here we call the narrow body hangar, and it was built in 1955 or so. And then to the left, you have what we call the super hangar, which was built in the 1970s, early 70s. And both of these were built by the TWA, Trans World Airlines. And um, at the time, Kansas City was a place where uh, the aviation um, world focused on because it's in the center of the country. So you could uh, transport people and goods from here to either coast fairly quickly. So this was a hub. And um, to use the airport here was very critical to some business operations for a lot of different um, you know, shipping and, and, and people transport. So this is why they built these very unique hangars in Kansas City. And the real, the real purpose was to allow for uh, TWA to do maintenance on their aircraft. So if they had aircraft from across the country, they could come to this facility and, and get work done, you know, get treatment, you know, get your like your oil change to your car, you know, do that type of work and get, get back out into the um, the operations of their their system for transporting um, people across the country. So yeah, I'll give you some of the feedback here. 1950s was when the overhaul base was originally constructed. It was a very important employer in Kansas City and still is. And um, a lot of jobs were created by this overhaul base. So it's uh, a lot of families here in the area have great stories about their parents who worked there and a lot of great memories. Um, but at, in the 1990s, TWA eventually went out of business, and and then the uh, overhaul base it went over to American Airlines, which is still around. And then at some point, American Airlines decided that they w weren't going to be running the overhaul base. So the city of Kansas City, Missouri, which is really the true owner of the airport and the overhaul base, they took over the property management. And so we've, you know, over the years, we have worked mostly with the city and the aviation department on the um, maintenance and investigation of the building of the hangars. So you have, again, here's another image of the two hangars and they're very unique architecturally. That's why uh, we've put them into the landmark category because you're not gonna see two buildings like this anywhere. Um, and we'll go into a little bit more about each building. The narrow body hangar the, uh, is the one that I said was built in 1955. It was built for, you know, planes of that era, which were a little smaller than the ones we use today for passenger um, jets. But what's really cool about it is the roof of the hangar supported by um, cables, multi-wire cables, like you would see a suspension bridge. But they use that approach for a building and so you have this column free structure, which allows them to put planes in there. Uh, here's another image. Um, here's a better image from the roof. So you can see the there's multiple cables. Uh, there's 228 cables, equal amount on either side of these walls. There's 28 walls and the cables come off the wall and they support the roof structure, which you can see there, which kind of has these up and down flow. And um, underneath there, that's where they fix the planes. So here's another picture. And uh, here's a good cross section that you can see. Uh, this might make a bit more sense. So on the left side, you can see where there's big open space there. There's no columns. So that's where the planes can come in and get serviced. It's the same on the right side. And then in the center of the building, they had what they call the center core. And the center core is where they had office space. 
Um, so here's another uh, image that shows a plan of the roof and some of the different roofing systems. But you can see the distinct center core of the building, which is between the, the, the roof areas. And they both were they, the center core and what we call the folded plates, which are supported by the cables. They have some different roofing, waterproofing techniques. And here's a picture inside of the narrow body hanger. You can see how much room you have in there. You have these really large doors that are um, operated. And um, now most of these planes that are of today, they don't necessarily fit all the way in, like the tail fits out a little bit. Some of them fit in there, but uh, I've been in there where they have four or five planes on both sides. So it's, you know, full operation and they're taking apart the planes and, and doing all that work. So the super hangar is on the left side of the of these two buildings. It was built for bigger jets. And uh, it's also got this really cool structure that's a parabolic roof structure. You can see here the parabolic roof structure. Um, I think the we don't know a lot about the designers, but they we're trying to be pretty ambitious with and make some type of statements here with the architecture because they could have done some different approaches, but they they wanted to utilize these 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 curved roofs and this is all made out of reinforced concrete, and so a reinforced concrete in this shape and form is is really uh, unique because you have to form the concrete with these shapes, and also this is pre pre and post tension concrete. So there, we have the original drawings for both buildings, but we don't have much information on why they did things a certain way. So we've gone in and done our own analysis, but um, I wanted to kind of show you some of the dimensions here. These are really large buildings, you know, 225 feet for each of these parabolic shells. Uh, they're pretty tall too. So when you're on the roof, um, it's pretty expansive area uh, and you uh, very easily could get lost on this roof if it seems like another world up there. Uh, some more critical pictures of the shape of the building, some cross sections. This was 1960s, you know, 1970s when they built it. And uh, I think this would be really challenging to build today with these kind of shapes. So they they did that back in the day with not the technology we have and the modeling um, skills that we use here at Walter P. Moore. Um, they did a lot of this, I'm pretty sure, with hand calculations and whatnot. All right, so let's take a break here. Christiana, any questions before we talk about the investigation? Well, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Um. In forensic engineering, what you obviously come across um, drawings that are older and years past, probably past yours. And what happens when you can't figure out like a building code or um, what they use to get to their calculations? Right. Well, we were lucky on this building. We had drawings, but most of the time we don't. So you have to investigate the building in such a way where you can get information on the structural systems to recreate the drawings yourself. And if you can recreate the drawings yourself, then you can analyze the building yourself and you can determine um, how they probably would have designed it. And you can determine how to fix it. You can determine how to uh, make it last another 50 years. And so um, we use um, visual techniques, we use uh, non-destructive techniques like you can see here in the picture where we can pick up on reinforcing locations. We take destructive materials, let's say on this project we took chunks of the concrete and then we tested it and we were able to get the compressive strength and we were able to get the material uh, makeup of the concrete as well from that testing. So we we take that information and then we're able to recreate the drawing, so to say. That's pretty cool. Um, mm -hmm. So in the comments, someone asked, how do you access a building like this? How do you access it? Yeah. Well, um, the roof, we are, were able to 
just walk onto the roof, but there are parts of the roof that you can't just walk on safely. So we would access with a um, a lift. Uh, there was a hundred foot, hundred fifty foot aerial lift that was uh, brought out to the site, and that was able to get us very close to certain parts of the roof that we couldn't just walk on. But we also, and I'll show you here in some of the pictures, we were able to use a uh, a technique called rope access, which was uh, we, we utilized so that we could get higher up and we attached ourselves and we literally used climbing techniques to climb down the cables. So we'll, I'll show you some pictures of that here in a few moments. Well, I look forward to seeing them. That sounds fun. Um, just a reminder to put your questions in the chat and David, you can keep on going. Okay. So next we have the uh, narrow body hangar investigation. And um, uh, so what, what we have here is from 2006 to 2008, we did our first study of that hangar. And uh, we did a lot of that structural analysis, I said. Uh, we did the roofing study. Um, we took some materials out and did testing. And then here over the last several years, we went back to the narrow body hangar and did kind of the same thing over because um, there wasn't much work that was done for about 10 years. And um, when you don't do work on a building for 10 years, you have to reinvestigate it to see how it's doing. So um, what we did here, our, our main purpose in this investigation was to study how this roof structure was doing in all its components. So the, the cables that you see here, we actually uh, brought in a team and we climbed the cables. And so that we could visually look at every cable, every inch, every foot of the cable and see if there was corrosion or wires that were deteriorating, okay? So you can see, I mean, literally, it wasn't me. I don't do this type of work because I, I don't have that uh, that skill. But we do have engineers on our team who do have the training and skill to do this kind of rope access work. And so they do it in a very safe way. But it's really uh, important to be able to get on top of these cables and see them up close. And then you can check the corrosion. Uh, you can look for places where the cable may be getting ready to fail. So you, you can see here all of the, um, every like I said, every cable was looked at closely. And what we did was any place that we saw a potential problem, we put these little black wires on there so that we could um, go back if we needed to go back and monitor those locations later, we could go right to them. So there was, um, from our 2006 investigation, there was still some of these wires that we found in 2017. So um, that was, you know, some little trick that we used. Here's a close up of what you see on these. These cables are pretty massive. They're like two inch diameter and they are made up of all these wire strands and they've been painted over the years, but they're typically like a galvanized metal. And, and these are special made. Uh, you, you don't just buy these cables at your local hardware shop. I mean, you have to order them and it takes, you know, several months to make a cable like this. Um, so what we're really concerned about is the corrosion, which is the rust that you see here on the left, or we're concerned about the wire. The individual wires, when they start to raise up, that means that maybe one of those wires has broken and these cables are tensioned. So they're, they're stressed, they're pulled, so that um, when they're pulled, that's that force is what allows the roof to be uh, um, suspended, okay? And then that force is, uh, it's like if you, you had a rope and you pulled it tight, and then you lock down that rope and put a knot in it so it couldn't move. That's the same concept of this, this cable-supported roof. So without these cables, you don't have a roof, and then you don't have a hanger, and you don't have a business to operate inside of it. Um, and we did even some really cool testing of these cables. We were trying to, um, there's some 
what they call electric magnetic uh, equipment that could test the part of the cable we couldn't see to see if there was any flaws or cracks in our breaks in those wires inside of the interior of the cables. We also tested the tension in the cables and that was pretty cool because you have to move the cable yourself which is hard to actually you can move these cables you just kind of you have to pull down on it with your whole body weight and it will start a like a movement and then you measure the period of the cable and that will measure the force and so we did that as well to compare the force in the cables to the force that we calculated in design to see how close they were um, because what happens is you lose the force in those cables after they're tensioned over time and the roof starts to sink a little bit over time. Um, another challenge here is, you know, they didn't think about the long-term waterproofing of these cables, which is really what's the potential hazard here. Uh, we've had two cables break in the history of this building, which is, you know, approaching uh, 70, 75 years old or so. Um, so two cables out of 228 that's pretty good but you don't want any cables to break and they break here at the lower part of the roof as they go into the roof you can see all this snow and ice that collects and then all this debris collects inside i don't know how any leaves are getting on this roof because there's no trees around the airport but you got leaves you got dirt and it's all going inside of these cable anchorages and uh, this is the problem, right? Because this is where you're going to get water collecting and potentially leading to corrosion and failure. Here's another picture of how much rust and crap has built up in there. Not a good thing. And so this was a picture or a figure we made to show to the city how much water could get inside of the cable anchorage just to um, illustrate uh, how important it is to uh, keep these water tight. So um, I think you can kind of get a sense of um, what the uh, the problems with water can be if you don't know, manage the the waterproofing correctly. And then this is on the same building. This is in that center core area. Um, when we first got there in 2006, we had all this water ponded in between the walls. I mean, there was areas that were uh, ankle deep in water like little lakes up there and it wasn't draining uh, so we did work to add drains and to redo the roofing we also have a lot of concrete deterioration on these roofs and uh, those those areas that are supported the concrete is just it's old and it needs to be updated so we went around and identified all these locations so that's a narrow body hanger now the super hanger, we didn't start really studying it until 2016. We started started with a roofing study, and then we did a full structural investigation of the super hanger so that we could get to know it because it's also so unique, uh, one of a kind building, a landmark building, but nobody really understood how it was standing. Nobody understood how it worked until we did this investigation. Um, we did have drawings, so you can see some of the um, information we got from the drawings on the design loads, and they use lightweight concrete, um, uh, but uh, we we didn't have a lot of information on actually how they built the building. Uh, we just had the drawings, so no stories on actually the construction. Um, here's another picture, and you've got this really unique shape that we've shown you. And we were trying to understand how the concrete was, how did they build this? I mean, did they actually have formwork? And then how is this shape maintained? And what we found is that they have um, post-tensioning -tension, post tendons inside of these concrete shells, which are anchored down at the very bottom of the building. And that force allows that concrete to stay in the air. So you've got like a, it's like a big tent like a tent you would have at um, a camp or a carnival. It's the same concept, but where it's anchored down at the ground and you've got, you know, the uh, ridge at the top, 
But instead of ropes, you have cables inside of the concrete. Instead of uh, canvas, you have concrete. So I mean, it's it's massive structure and a, a massive engineering feat. And then at, this is an example of the anchorage at the very bottom in the basement of the building. These are actually the tendons that are in one location. And, uh, you know, these are 50 years old now. And you have to do maintenance on these tendons as well and, and do things like put grease in there to make sure that there doesn't get any water into these. So that there's a lot of work there. So we we had to climb around the super hangar and walk up those parabolics and it was like you were walking on the moon or something you can see they had this um foam roofing system that was on there for we don't know how many years we think it was original very little repairs and so this foam had a coating but you can see these little plants were growing through the foam um, here's some other areas where the foam was like ripping itself apart, the coatings peeling off, you got plants growing. It's just a big mess up here. And um, we were tasked with um, understanding what's here, what condition the concrete's in, do we have any potential failures? So we had to go around and document conditions and cut into the foam and study the structure in this part of the roof, which we call the pods, there's like over 200 pods and these pods are 40 feet by 40 feet. And then they go down like a cone and you, you literally have to like run down into the pod and run out of it to, to get down in there. So they're, they're fairly steep. So, um, but we found lots of places where the concrete was deteriorating and the concrete is pretty thin. It's only maybe uh, five or six inches thick because it's um, a lightweight concrete and they didn't want to have a lot of weight obviously because you're trying to hold up this concrete so any spalls or cracks in the concrete or corrosion in the reinforcing is a sign that we uh, may be having some problems so we need to fix those areas All right, um, I'm going to take a break now. Um, any questions before we talk about some of the repairs we've done? Yeah, we have quite a few in our chat right now. Okay. And someone asked, uh, with these cables, how often do you need to replace them? Or should someone replace them? <laughs> They've never been replaced. We uh, That's a question that we uh, have been pondering. Uh, we do think it's time that they be replaced. So, uh, like I said, they've lasted over 50 years. I think 50 years is a pretty good service life for a cable like this, um, especially since there's not much maintenance and the cable's exposed. A lot of bridge cables that are similar, they, they have a better waterproofing, like a jacket around the cable, so they're not exposed directly to the weather. So... I, I would say 50 years was, is a fair service life, and it's it's time to uh, replace them because we don't have a good system to know what's going on inside the cable. We just see the outside of it. We don't know what's going on inside. And so you, you could get a failure at any moment, and then a cable snaps. And that wouldn't be a good thing because there's so much force in the cable. Yeah, and it holds up the building. Yeah. Now you have 228 of them, but at the same time, uh, with, if you lose one cable, that cable is going to go wild when it breaks. So it might take out other cables. It might damage the concrete. Uh, you just don't know what could happen. It would be not an event that you would want to be in the building when it happens. So we want to. So we haven't had that happen on our watch, and we're trying to get out ahead of it and work with the city to do some. Um, repair uh, we're going to try to replace a few cables and see how hard that is to do uh, and then create a program where we can gradually replace all of them that's pretty cool so we don't necessarily have a system to identify when these cables lifespans are over yet not really um, i mean we've tried like i said some visual techniques and non-destructive techniques but it's all just uh it, it's, it's using you know, you know, trying to pull all that information together, 
but you're still not finding like a definitive answer. It's just, there's not going to be anything that just tells you right off. If you find this change the cable, we don't, there's, there's nothing out there that tells you that. So maybe you'll be the first. Maybe. <laughs> Uh, there's another question, um, and it goes back to when we were you were speaking about concrete. It asks, what is lightweight concrete, and what's the difference between that and normal concrete? Okay, so normal concrete um, might weigh, uh, what we, 150 pounds per uh, cubic foot. Um, no, lightweight concrete could be a hundred pounds, 120 pounds per cubic foot. So you have less weight to hold up, right? And, and when you're trying to hold up this structure that is just supported by cables, the lighter the structure, the easier it is for those cables to hold it up, right? So, um, so that's why I think they use lightweight concrete for these buildings. Okay, so would it have less of a lifespan than normal concrete, or does it have about the same lifespan? It doesn't have less of a lifespan, it's just lighter. So it's not, um, we don't always use it in buildings because there's some disadvantages to that being a uh, lighter weight. Um, there's also the aggregate you use in lightweight concrete, and on this building, these buildings in particular, they, um, the aggregate is lighter. And that aggregate, unfortunately, when it gets wet, sometimes that aggregate actually holds water or swells a little bit. So it's not as, mm, its performance isn't as good as normal weight concrete when dealing with water and the potential issues of ice and freeze thaw. Where you, and you know, this is in Kansas City. So today, literally today, it's, I think, like 65 degrees. And tomorrow, or in two days, it could be 25 degrees. I mean, it changes that fast in, in this time of year. So you go through freeze thaw cycles in that concrete. If it rains or snows, it soaks, that lightweight concrete tends to soak in more of the water than the normal weight would. And that's why we're really um, interested in protecting the concrete on these buildings with roofing and waterproofing systems so they don't take that extra water on. Oh, pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. uh that's all the questions for right now. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go through this last section, which will be um, some of the repairs we've done to date. Um, like I said before, we're still working on this um, project. The thing about it, which I think you, hopefully you've gathered here, is when you're working on landmark buildings, um, there's many projects. There's not one project. You're, you're, you're like, connected to the building for your whole career. I started working on this building, these two buildings in 2006, and it's, you know, we're going into 2022 pretty soon. And I'm still working on these buildings because there's so much to do on these uh, buildings that you can't do it all at one time. It's too expensive or, um, you know, maybe it's not needed at the moment. And so we stay connected to these buildings. So I'm going to show you some of the repairs we've done, but by no means have we done everything that needs to be done on these buildings. Um, we, we work with the city and we put together a program where uh, we put together repair strategies over a 10, 20 year period. And we say, you need to do these five things next year, these five things three years from now. And hopefully, we're able to get these buildings to last another 50 years by, you know, that approach. So um, one thing we did uh, right away on the narrow body hanger, remember those anchorages I showed you with all the snow and dirt and grass growing inside? We, we hired a contractor to clean them out, right? <laughs> Which you say, well, David, shouldn't somebody been doing that all along? Well, nobody had been cleaning them out. We don't know. I don't think anyone had cleaned out these anchorages for probably 25 years at minimum. Okay. And so we got a contractor in there to clean them out so that we could see more inside of the, the anchorage because this is where the failure, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen inside of there. And um, 
So it was it was really uh, interesting because then we were better able to understand the inside of the connection of the cable to the building. It's different than what's shown on the drawings. So I, I put this here as um, under repairs because it's more maintenance, but since it hadn't been done, uh, we thought it was the first thing that was critical before we go into actually trying to replace a cable. Let's just clean out the anchors and see what's wrong. Uh, we also, in the center core of the building, we did some pretty extensive um, roofing and waterproofing repairs to prevent the ponding water. And um, we added drains. We did some concrete repairs to the walls. This was done from about 2007 to 2009. So actually, um, in recent years, when we were there, um, I was actually on this roof maybe three weeks ago. And we're starting to see, um, after like 10, 15 years of, from those previous repairs, we're starting to see some things that need to be repaired again, right? So um, that's why I said you're, uh, you're, that's why we talk about being a building doctor because you're never uh, away from the maintenance or the physical upkeep of these buildings. There's always something wrong, something you got to go back and, and readdress. Um, and that's about all we've done on the narrow body hanger because um, we're still trying to get to the point where we do that cable program. On the super hanger, though, uh, we just completed in the last six months a major roofing replacement. And um, what was pretty cool was we were able to get up on those parabolics and tear off all the foam that we think was original. And that foam was really difficult to get off. Um, we worked with the contractor and did some different mock-ups and see how hard it would be to get it off. But we needed to get that foam off to expose the concrete. Um, here's a picture of the roofing team up on the parabolic, sc literally scraping off the foam by hand. And that yellow residue you can see, that's still, that's the residue of the foam that's stuck, you know, that's stuck onto the concrete real well. So um, that's, this is how it had to be done. And one of the issues during construction is the airport runway for the Kansas City International Airport is just just to the left of the, of the super hangar. I mean, it's like right there. And one of the big scares was we didn't want any of the foam to blow off the building during demolition and blow onto the runway, right? Because that could get into a plane uh, engine and create problems. So the roofer had to do this very slowly. Um, they had to put up some netting and some fencing in a way to uh, monitor the winds every day and uh, it was a slow process but they they did it a uh, pretty good job of it and then once we got all that foam off we went back with a new roofing system which uh, was what we call a a pvc uh, roofing material it's a membrane sheet good and uh, it was directly adhered to the exposed concrete so uh, you can see here there's the roofing team rolling that out and working on that gradually. So this took several months to do each parabolic. And you kind of see here, this is the finishing touches. You see these little bumps every now and then. These were uh, areas where there are hangers that go through the roof. So inside of the interior, they may have like a um, something that's hanging off the roof. And they have a plate on the roof, a through bolt, and we had to make sure that all of those were waterproof too. So that's all those little bumps you see. Uh, so this was this took a lot of time to get watertight and to um, get that roofing system on there. And uh, here's some more perspective showing the parabolic and then some of these pods that we actually did re-roof as well. And some of them we haven't got to yet because if they weren't leaking, it was decided not to do those pods because of funding. So gradually over the years, next few years, we'll get all those those pod areas. We'll get all those roofed as well. But it's uh, it's very expensive to work on this roof and get um, a contractor here to to do this. It's, it's very time consuming and costly.
But uh, this is what it looks like now. And when you fly into the airport, um, you know, you you land or you take off right next to it. And so I, I and I've done that before. So that's pretty re- rewarding to fly in and, and see the, you know, one of the, the buildings you work on in the finished product. So. All right, so that's it. That's my last slide, but I uh, wanted to see if we had any any more questions. Yeah, that was awesome, David. Thank you. Uh, we have one last question, and someone is going back to the flooding system. What are you going to do with the cables to not have them flood or corrode anymore in that area? That's a good question. We We haven't completely figured that out. Um, that's going to be part of a, we're doing a pilot program with the city where we're going to replace a few cables. And in that replacement, we're going to try out some different techniques um, to see if we can get those those um, cylinders where the cable goes in, the anchors, if we can figure out some different ways to get it watertight. Um, what they did in the past, they just filled those up with um, roofing product for roofing cement which wasn't a good idea because that ended up holding water up against the cable itself uh, um, they also had boots they, they tried to fabricate some, which is something we may try again fabricate like a special boot that wraps around the cable and the cylinder um, but it had to be custom made um, and had to be applied in the field of course and weld it. So there's a lot of thought that needs to go into that, which we'll try out in this pilot program. So until then, water's still getting in there. So they they uh, we're just making sure that the maintenance happens and they get cleaned out every year. So well, that's all the questions we have for today. Mm-hmm. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, thank you, David, for speaking with us and having a great presentation. I learned a lot from it. And I hope to see you all in the new year and have a great holiday. Thank you, everybody.